I suspect for uh, many of you, especially ladies, this has been a somewhat of a challenging uh, week because we've talked a lot about um, an area of great concern. I, I think for a woman who is married, there is no greater concern in her life than to be married to somebody whom she can feel safe being in the relationship with, that she can be vulnerable, that she can share the secrets of her heart and he will listen and listen carefully and and not dismissively or casually. And I would just simply say that's pretty hard just because the way a man bra brain works. You see, men tend to be more cognitive than emotive. In fact, uh, it's suggested that the reason why we have two spheres of our brains is because in a very generalized sense, they serve two very different functions in our thinking process, that we are, men tend to be more, uh, we would say, uh, left brain. They tend to think more in the cognitive, detailed way that we see a problem and we want to fix it. Uh, whereas women tend to be heavier on the emotive side. In fact, there's a network on the top of our heads that's called the corpus callosum, and it's really the, the communication network, the wiring that connects the two sides of the brain so we can think and we can feel. And one of the things I find very fascinating is that the woman's corpus callosum tends to be much larger than a man's, which means communicating from side to side takes longer for men than it does for women. That's why oftentimes women look at a situation and they can tell you what they feel about it uh, very, very quickly. On the other side, you have men who uh, can look at something and they, they can tell you what they think about it. But if a woman asks them, so what are you thinking or what are you feeling right now? Most men go blank because quite honestly, they don't have a clue what they're thinking. It takes a while for the emotions to catch up with their thoughts. And I'll be quite honest, there are times uh, there are a lot of times, too many times I, like to, I, I can't stand to count, where um, I've been in a, a conversation, a situation, and something would strike me as, as being different. And my, in my mind, I'm trying to think, what is it that, that doesn't really add up here, doesn't line up? What, what am I feeling? And usually it's 24 hours later, but when suddenly, oh. And I've, I've learned uh, that when I think something and it doesn't seem right, that I shouldn't go back and talk to that other person until I've had some time to think and pray about it. Because it takes a long time for me to understand what was it in the, in the emotions of that interchange that wasn't right. And that's where you begin to pick up on subtle, subtle messages. You know, most of us communicate on a lot of different levels, not just verbally. Uh, we talk about body language, and, and body language is, is a, you know, a powerful part of communication. Some people say that you know 80% of what we say is a consequence of what we see people saying, so that it can be very, very different things. You know, when when uh, Kennedy and and Nixon had their debate, people who watched the debate on TV said Kennedy won, and people who watched the listened to it on the radio said Nixon won. Well, why did the people who watched it on TV say that? Because Nixon, his words were good. What he said was right. In fact, he was much more experienced and, and uh, clear on the issues than was Kennedy. But beads of sweat were running down his face in this first ever televised um, uh, de presidential debate. And as a consequence, people saw that he was a nervous wreck. He was very uncomfortable. And they felt that they didn't trust what he was saying, and so they sided with Kennedy. And so we have to understand that what we, how we react to people on a physical way, we, people can tell very quickly whether we're happy to see them or we're not happy to see them. You know, somebody shows up at your front door and you open the door, you can tell immediately if you're sensitized at all whether they're happy that you came or they're sad that you came. And this is what happens oftentimes in, in relationships where especially husbands, you can be so guilty of this that you come home from a hard day and you don't want to talk to anybody. You just want to sit down and turn on the news or eat your food or get into your favorite game or whatever. And you don't want to spend any time interacting with your wife or your kids. Um, what you communicate inadvertently by that is they're not that important to you. And that's why being able to spend time with each other at the beginning and the end of every day is critically important. 
One of the things that my wife and I have found invaluable in our relationship is to be able to set aside enough time in the morning, and sometimes that means you have to get up a lot earlier than you want to, but setting enough time in the morning so that not only can we have our own personal devotional time where we read the Word and pray, but then we can come together and pray. We've gotten to the point now where if we have days that get interrupted and we can't spend time together praying, we feel like we have left ourselves vulnerable to all sorts of spiritual warfare and attack. It's such a critically important, and it's one of the ways in which we end up getting on the same page. That when we've learned to pray over the years together, we, we kind of come to a consensus about this is what we feel that God wants us to do. And so, and in doing that at the end of the day is just as valuable to kind of debrief on the day. When your wife asks you, how did your day go? That, you know, the answer, fine, is that's not good enough. If your boss asked you a question and said, hey, I want you to do this and this and this, what do you think? Then you probably would tell him or her what, what you thought, how you felt about that. You need to understand that your wife needs that same kind of input. She needs to know what is going on in your life. How are things moving? Are we moving forward together? Are there issues arising between us? And when you're silent and you withdraw and pull away, particularly if she has you know, been a little little surly with you over one thing or another, you just really reinforce the feelings or the fears that she has that you're pulling away from her. And so these are really key junctures. And that's why I said, as I said yesterday, the heaviest burden is uh, is upon the husband because he, if he is the head of the home and he's the leader of the home, he has the larger responsibility. And what I find today, ladies, and many of us don't understand this, but it's important for you to recognize this, that what is really wrong in in most marriages isn't because the husband is trying to be too domineering, but just the opposite. He's, He's running away. He's not leading. He's not letting you know what he thinks, particularly in the area of spiritual things. That's why when Paul wrote this, he said, Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Again, I've never ever heard a wife complain that her husband just gives up too much of himself for her. You know, uh, <clears throat> there have been so many times like a uh, football game will come on that, you know, uh, I'm interested in. And my wife would go out of her way to make that a special time for me. But there have been other times where I've recognized that, you know, my wife really is going through this or that and she doesn't want to sit in front of a football game that means nothing to her. And so I've just turned the TV off. I've learned to turn the TV off and say, you know, we don't need to watch that. Let's let's just talk and see what's going on. Or let's do something that you want to do, something that's fun for you. That's that idea of, of if you're a shepherd of sheep, you look at the sheep and you don't expect them to be meeting your need, but rather you're looking and saying, how can I minister to their needs? And many men feel like, I I tell men oft times, the problem with you probably is your mother loved you too much. She, the sun rose and set on you, and you expect to be married to somebody who builds every moment of their life around satisfying your every whim and your every need. That can kind of work early in a marriage, at least until kids come and then just forget about it. You know, no woman has that bandwidth of energy, strength, and creativity. I often say that mothers of small children only have one emotion, and that's fatigue. And I've seen that many marriages fall apart at that point because the self-centeredness of many husbands is that, hey, she's neglecting my needs, and he's not even stopping to think, well, what about her needs? That's supposed to be what we're dealing with the forefront of our mind is what are her needs because my job is to love her as christ loved the church and how did he love the church it says to make her holy how are you investing in her spiritual growth if you don't read with her if you don't pray with her if you don't go to church with her if going to church is always her idea and she's having to drag you out of the bed or you're always finding an excuse to skip church then you're falling down in your leadership You're supposed to be doing those things that would enhance her spiritual growth. You cleanse her by the washing of the water through the Word. Reading the Word together, as well as reading it on your own, but spending that time in the Word together, ministering to each other. Uh, My wife and I, it's kind of a neat thing before we pray that oftentimes she shares with me things that God has been speaking to her in the Word, and, and I do, not nearly as much as she does with me. And I have to admit, a lot of the insights I find in my teaching come from her things she's seen and she's come across and she's shared with me. But that's the idea that we recognize the Word is there to cleanse and to wash us. 
And our goal is to present her as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or any, any blemish, but blameless and holy. That should be the, the primary goal of a husband in his relationship to his wife. That's how you lead her. Then my goal is to see you become everything that God wants you to be, to fulfill all of the purposes that he has for your life. And I just say that most men have become so narcissistic in thinking that marriage exists to satisfy their every need that their wives go away feeling neglected and because, in fact, they are being neglected. So gentlemen, if you're listening to this, I pray in the name of Jesus, you will listen to this. You want her to love you and respect you and to be affectionate towards you, then show her that kind of Christ-like love and it will come. But if you don't, then don't be surprised if she pulls back. Now ladies, I'm not saying you have an excuse because you have a mutual obligation if you're a Christian to love him in spite of his bad behavior up to a point, as we understand, adultery and other things, desertion, are definitely the point that if you go beyond that, then all bets are off. But we won't get into talking about marriage and divorce right now. But the whole thing I think is important is, men, we need to understand that this is your primary responsibility, to care for her spiritual, emotional, and physical welfare. And if, if anybody's not prepared to do that, they should not get married. They need to understand, I'm marrying you to take on that burden, that obligation, that responsibility. So I hope this gives some insight. Pray that God will bless you. And uh, if you're not f angry at me or fed up, then we'll continue on with the next section tomorrow. God bless you and go in his grace.